As you know, it is a total mess, uh, it's chaos, and it's currently a failed state. And one of the reasons why here at the Tricontinental we wanted to organise something is first fill a gap, inform you on what's happening, because that gap isn't being filled by the mainstream media who are simply not fulfilling their duty and telling you and letting you know what is happening. But I think it's also an opportunity, and I think given recent events in Paris where freedom of speech and, and France is all the rage, I think it's an opportunity for us at Tricontinental to do our little jacuzzi moment. And I think we really need to, to, make, to point to who the culprits are. And the culprits are obviously the governments who are responsible for this onslaught and the consequences of it. Uh, public opinion who really wasn't on board and didn't really live up to its duty the way it had done in the past, holding to account its uh, government who actually went to war. And a war has consequences and I think the people who elect politicians need to hold their politicians to account. And of course the media, I mean the media played a major role in selling this conflict. It deflected from all the other opportunities to actually avoid conflict and instead of pushing and informing the people of all the other opportunities that there were to actually bring about reconciliation in Libya, they beat the drums of war continuously, making this conflict palatable to public opinion and therefore making this bombing campaign, a six month long onslaught on the entire coastline of Libya, absolutely acceptable. And as a result, obviously, there have been scores of people killed. The entire infrastructure of the country has been destroyed. Uh, it now hosts, obviously, various militias from God knows where and God knows who. It's threatening to engulf the wider Arab world, and of course, it's already having consequences on the African continent. Um, it's a very, it's a very, very serious uh, hour for, for for Libya, for the Arab world again, and for Africa. And I'm hoping that tonight, uh, through our various speakers, you'll get a better understanding of the situation. Without further ado, I'll start with our first speaker. And I'll have to read my notes because he's quite, you know, he's got quite a CV. So our, our first speaker is a Lib Libyan academic, Mabrouk Derbesh. He's a writer and academic. He's a graduate from Royal Road in Canada. He's worked as a professor in Tripoli, uh, Tripoli University, sorry. Uh, he now teaches internationally. His work has been published in an Arab newspaper, in Calgary Herald, in Al-Quds, and he regularly appears for BBC Speaks, I think, for BBC Radio and for Al Jazeera. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Mabrouk Thank you so much. And I, uh, I thank you all for... I speak softly, so I hope you can hear me. Um, I want to thank everybody for inviting me here, the organizers. Um, Thank you all for coming. And I just wanted to make it very clear um, that the people who had the problem with NATO was the problem with NATO was not related to Gaddafi for us. I mean, Mustafa, for example, a colleague of mine, I haven't seen him in years and years. We, were, we, we used to be young and used to criticize Gaddafi when we were kids, and we used to speak against Gaddafi all the time. <coughs> Because Gaddafi was the establishment for us. We were, you know, the young revolutionaries, or kids, and you know, we were lefties, and you know, uh, even Gaddafi himself was for us an establishment. So, um, so I wanted to make this disclaimer: it's not about the position of government, it's not about political position, but it's about the nation of Libya. Um, and there is no excuses are made for the problems with Libya before what happened in February 2011. And and this should this should not allow us to make any other excuse, excuse either for the, what happened afterwards. But let's um, let me allow me to give you an idea. I think the West, and this is where we start. The West, I think, got philosophical with Libya and used the term um, moral equivalency, which you guys probably know about from the, the term that is used quite a bit when it comes to the Israeli. Or the, the Jewish-Palestinian conflict. And so Gaddafi is a dictator. He's, uh, he's had quarrels with the West, many of them may add. And, and he, had, uh, he had issues. He opposed everything that is Western. He, um, he's a nationalist. So many things. So for him, for them, well, he represented the evil that is on the other side of the aisle. So for that, we can really do anything we want. We can destroy the country. We can destroy its infrastructure, we can destroy its army, about 30,000 soldiers 
we've been soldiers. This is an estimation, and being very, um, this is, I'm just, I'm not really telling you exactly what other people are saying. I'm just giving you the lower end of the estimation, which is about 50,000 army individuals of the Libyan army have been killed, assassinated. I mean, when you have an Apache that is hunting soldiers in their camps, sitting in their camps, that, that's an assassination. That's not a war. And power plants, hospitals, schools, TV stations, speaking of, you know, we're just, you know, we're talking about the Paris thing now. I mean, TV station, I, I mean, I think Sukant was there during the time when the TV station was bombed. And in Tripoli, a TV station was bombed by NATO, by the British and the French government. And so, but I mean, all that, I'm sure of, most of you are followers of what's going on in Libya, so let's not reminisce over what, why Gaddafi was taken out, why Gaddafi had, was an issue for a lot of people uh, in the West. It was not an issue for a lot of people in the, that part of the world. Gaddafi's horizon, or Gaddafi's world, is not Libya. It goes beyond that. Um, so, but let's, I mean, the, the West manipulated lots of things. I mean, you can manipulate anything. You can, you can talk about Gaddafi as being an influence, and that's for them, it's a problem. To, to a lot of people, that's a good thing. So, but let's talk about what happened after the taking out of Gaddafi, after the assassination of Gaddafi, basically. And um, we have religious schools, radical religious schools are built in Libya. And that's a fact that most people should know. And these schools are actually um, bringing up, you know, the Al Qaeda, ISIS, um, uh, Wahhabi, whatever you want to call it, whatever the term you have, because they have different schools of thought. And these schools are schools are separate, uh, are are all over Libya right now. Um, women's rights, um, women's rights have been not being curtailed. That we actually completely dismissed. I mean, in the glorious manifestation of their um, biggest event, the new regime in Libya declared that women now, uh, men have the rights to marry for women. This is the first thing they did. This is the, the beginning, first speech of the February regime. I mean, if you just go back to the official documents and you'll find it. Actually, it was in the third or the fourth sentence. So it gives you an idea what kind of government is coming. What, what kind of people are, are here, and it gives you an idea of what the thought process behind all this. Um, education and civil um, institutions have been replaced by militias, by um, uh, militias um, institutions. So basically, you have uh, police stations that are replaced by militia group, acts as a police station. You go to the police station, they tell you, no, we can't do anything. We don't even have guns. We can't even issue a warrant. You go to them. They'll actually point to them, and they're next door. And these guys can do whatever you want them to do. They can carry out uh, um, arrest without any cause. I mean, they're a militia, and most of them, they're militias, and most of them are graduate, prison graduates. So, um, in the last. 15 years have been a development in Libya. If you're familiar with Libya, it's been developed in Libya that the infrastructure has been updated. So a lot of contracts have been given out to new bridges, new hospitals, new schools, and, uh, new, uh, new, new energy uh, uh, plants, and, and sustainability programs and projects. And, and the estimates for those are about $100 billion uh, at the cost of the government, government expenditure on that. These these um, these projects are being completely cancelled. Um, actually, the ones that were in existence are being damaged in purpose. Just to show that Gaddafi didn't do anything in the past 40 years. Imagine, you know, just Gaddafi sat in power, came and didn't, didn't do anything for 40 years and just watched and just controlled people. That's what he did. Uh, most of these people, by the way, who said that, they were sent out, out of Libya to study and were paid for by the government money. So these graduates were, were, uh, who were paid by taxpayers' money, Libyan money, and now coming back and saying, well, you know, we had no expenditure in the last four years. And the Gaddafi government was just a regime that was just sitting in people's chests and just doing nothing. 
Uh, another, another thing, uh, there's an estimate of about, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm going with the lower estimates here, about 12,000 prisoners. Uh, in contrast, when I said that all the contracts were canceled uh, for the Libyan infrastructure, updating the Libyan infrastructure over the last 15 years, is the last four years, only contracts for prisons have been issued. And those contracts for prisons, imagine that, the whole revolution that's working now for four years, only was able to build prisons. Those prisons are built by <coughs> British contractors, and French contractors, and sadly Canadian contractors for me, personally. Um, another result for, for people who really um, um, are familiar with the West and history with black people, um, there is about 40,000 blacks from the city of Tawarba and other cities as well being displaced. 40,000 people in modern day have been displaced because of their color because of what they look like. And they've been taken out of the city completely. And now they live refugees around cities in Libya. They, uh, they live in camps. They don't have power. There's children who go to school for four years now. Um, 1.5, some say 2 billion, uh, 2 million. One, I think it's about 1.5 million people are being displaced outside of Libya. These people are not given refugee status. On purpose. These people are in Europe, in Egypt, in Tunisia. They're thought of as tourists. Imagine that. I mean, you're 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 a refugee. You're 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 running for your life, and the world, the United Nations, and the West Western powers are not considering you as a refugee. Even here in London, in England, we have some of Libyans, some of them in this room. The government knows that these people are actually here because. If they go back to Libya, they'll be killed, but they still have not given them refugee status. So they are living in a, in a, in a wormhole. Like they have no idea. They're just hanging there. They have no idea, no status whatsoever. And again, hospitals and power plants were destroyed during the fighting in the last, you know, you've seen, you probably followed the fighting in the last year, but also before that. And the absence of fiscal policy. Uh, on top of that, government expenditure on just salaries to those militia uh, groups jumped. I mean, they count those salaries as um, government expenditure salaries for uh, civil service. So the salary, how we count that, the salary, the, uh, the civil, civil servant salary was about seven billion before that. Now it's 29. So imagine how much is being spent on those militias. And local press completely eliminated. There is nothing. There is no newspaper in Libya except the one that speaks for the February Revolution, which means everything is good. And flowers are coming out every morning, and the birds are singing. And freedom now you can. We got rid of Gaddafi. Now you can inhale freedom. And um, and the ones that speak out that are actually outside of Libya, even the ones that belong to the government, the new government. I mean, you got uh, the ones that have been subsidized by the, the, the Qatar government, the one called Libya Lahra or Libya Freedom, is actually located in Qatar. Uh, another newspaper is called Al Wasab, is, is, uh, is in uh, Egypt. They, even those ones who speak once in a while, they talk, you know, they tell the truth once in a while, you know, once a year, maybe. And they tell you, uh, they tell you that uh, they can't even stay in Libya. And their offices in Libya, they've been, they've been destroyed or burned. And the local journalists, especially the women, are raped or assassinated. And uh, political activists, women, I mean, you've heard about the lady in Benghazi uh, who just got assassinated in her home. And she was on the phone with, uh, with the TV station at the same time, and they killed her in Corpoc. There is no, uh, nobody is really saying, no, we didn't do this. They, they actually take responsibility for all this. I'm not right, making these things up uh, based on my understanding of things. That's what they say. And, and we have, finally, we have um, an ISIS-controlled cities, like the city of Dagna, for example. It's not part of Libya anymore. It's an ISIS city. 
It belongs to the, the group in Iraq, and, and we have another one. And they are, th those radical groups, by the way, they are, uh, it, it's, um, they're not all the same. So we have, you know, we're, we're blessed in Libya by having all of them. Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, Al-Wahhabis, Salafis, um, I mean, we've heard names now, the Ansar Sharia, like the people who uh, believe in Sharia and their form of Sharia or understanding Sharia. And so now Al Qaeda, it's almost like a competition between them. ISIS took Dharma, Al Qaeda took Sir. So, you know, and uh, uh, you probably guys know where Dharma is. Dharma is in the east of Libya, Sir is in the middle of Libya. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I mean, a lot of things. Most of you guys know more about this, and you probably heard more about this. And some of you know a lot more about this and what happened after uh, the February of 2011. So, we Libyan intellectuals or Libyan um, the Libyan people in general are very angry, and, and we're angry because. Of of many things that the West is doing on top of this. I mean, the intervention of Libya was not, to begin with, was a mistake. What follows was even a greater mistake. What the policy has been taken after, even after the West realized that they screwed up, they still make the mistake because they cannot admit that they screwed up. So, we're angry with the British policy, with the, this term, and great thinking, and I'll give you an example of that. There was a gentleman in uh, working for uh, for the for the British government uh, in Kuwait, and he was the ambassador of Britain to Kuwait. His name is uh, wait for his name. Some of you probably know him, um, but um, he was taken after just one year of his uh, placement. He's supposed to be there for four years. The reason why he was taken out of there because he had sex with his supporter. He's married with four children, and he had sex with a male, married female with, uh, who was working for him in the embassy, the British embassy in Kuwait. This gentleman, after he's been taken out of Kuwait, has been sent to Libya. And Ma his name is Michael, Michael Harry. And, and th this reminds me really of what Cameron says about uh, Christmas values and all that. I'm not sure if this is part of exporting values to the Islamic world. So they took the worst kind of the foreign house, a man who um, has no ethics, and they sent him to be making, uh, uh, making the decisions uh, for, the, for the foreign office in Libya. And this is the things that we, we have. And just, just, this is just a little example. This Arwen guy keeps on going from, he knows all the militias. He has contacts with all the militias. Um, he hasn't. He hasn't spoken to any of the activists in Libya, either from the previous government or the new government. He only has connections with those militias, and he manipulates things, he makes things worse, and this guy is the one who is responsible for making policies for Britain. Another point I would like to mention that when Libyans tried to have a democracy in Libya through a new parliament, that was after the after this debacle took place and tried to settle down, and they had an election, and for some reason Libyans didn't take the religious group, the Islamic Brothers, shows that Libyan people really have a different view of what the, the radical groups are. Uh, their understanding is more maybe mature than what the West is. So the West thought, no, we need to insert a government that is related to the government of Biden. But during that time, uh, there was the Islamic Brotherhood were winning in, uh, in Asia. So Hillary Clinton visited Libya and, uh, and instructed the new parliament to split and to change the votes from having 80% liberals or secular, secular, uh, uh, or a secular group to uh, and 20% uh, or 15% uh, Islam Brotherhood to 50. So that's what that's what the West did, and Libyan people at, the, at that point felt a little bit disappointed by what the Americans and what the British uh, and I understood at that point what they meant by the word democracy. Um, I. And 
we don't have much time here to go over a lot of things, but I mean, to conclude this, I would like to say that um, we need to work together to defrag all these missing parts. Um, it doesn't matter where you come from or what your opinion of Gaddafi is. Libya now in a very dismal state. Libya, the disarray of Libya is beyond, it's beyond um, any um, nightmare you can think of. People don't go to school, women don't go, to, don't go shopping. Uh, uh, you can get shot in the street without, uh, without any reason, without any reporting. Um, and if you are from a certain family or certain tribe or certain cities, you can be taken out. Um, again, I told you the number of uh, prisoners in Libya. I mean, that used to be uh, called out for uh, having 120 radical Muslims in prison. Now there's about 12,000 people, and that's the official number from Human, Resource, uh, Human, uh, Human Rights Watch, which I don't trust fully, but I'm just, you know, just, uh, this is the number, so. Uh, 12,000. I think the number is greater than that because the, the, the I, I know the way things work in Libya. There's prisons and houses. There's a family we heard about just the last three months. A whole family of 16 members were prison in the last four years in their own house. Were prisoners in the basement. And nobody knows anything about them. They've been raped, men and women, in their, fa in their house for the last year. So you have these sort of prisons that are unofficial. Human Rights Watch do not go there, and even if they go there, they would not, it's very hard to, to report. So my, uh, my idea is, my terrorist is, is, uh, could be your hero, and I understand this, the West may think that way. Uh, my, your hero could be, is my enemy, and I'm, uh, I'm willing to make friends with the enemy if the goal is to really advance some sort of solution to the way, to the things that are happening in Libya. Um, there has to be a paradigm shift in Libya. The way the, this third rate thinking by the British government and the uh, French government needs to change. I've been told that I, uh, I already have a few seconds, so I, uh, and, uh, so I, I want to thank you all, and, it's, um, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you.